Do you think social media has made us lazy in trying to find good journalism? Like we just sort of open an app and it's all there, like the, the latest yeah. series. And, and whereas before, if you want to find out about something, you kind <clears> of <throat> had to you did at least search out a little more than you do now. Like, do you, do you think that's made us lazy? Yeah. I think it's, it's sort of a, a blessing and a curse because I, you know, while yes, I do think it's made people rely on other people's information, sort of more secondhand social media information, which is not ideal. Mm. Um, more people are being brought into the fold of even being aware of what is going on. So, you know, you, you kind of just got to look at the odds. I mean, most people, you want most people to know what's going on. And you kind of, there's a little bit of hope that they'll get it from the best information source, but you know, they probably won't, but we're still better off with people being aware. So I, I think that social and without social media, a lot of our like independent news sources wouldn't be able to get any attention um, because we're so blacked out from the mainstream and from information. So social media, while allows a certain amount of laziness, um, also allows platforms like mine or yours to have a, a voice where we wouldn't. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's good and bad. It needs to be a utility, yeah. you know, it yeah. needs to be a nationalized utility. And, um, and then that would just be, and then we would solve that the whole dilemma with it. You think that would help? Oh yeah. I but know. Like, I mean, I mean, I'm just, <sighs> I'm skeptical just because I don't feel like giving the, 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 the another ring of the establishment, another, you know, method of control is, is a great idea. You know, they have it anyway. Well, they already yes. do. They already control it. They just control it through those oligarchs. But the problem is, is when you do it that way, then we don't have First Amendment rights because it's a private company. Mm. So I we, mean, could you not better legislate for that rather than say like, right, imagine Trump runs in twenty. Well, you can, but this also has to do with um, the idea of broadband for everybody and access to information and that this really is our public forum now. So you, you, you're sort of um, saying like that this is the equivalent of the public square in front of city hall, because that's really what, what we see now it's, it, it is. And so, yeah, that needs to be public domain. And then it becomes um, nobody can infringe your rights to speech, blah, blah, blah. The reason they keep it the way it is, is because they're essentially able to control our speech without it being a violation of the Constitution. Mm. So they work in conjunction with Google and Facebook and, all, and Amazon and all of these things to keep us completely suppressed. And we really have no recourse because they're private companies. So it's, you know, yeah, I see the suspicion, but it's we're already getting nationalized propaganda talking points. The only difference is there's oligarchs in the middle that are profiting from it. So we're, we're sort of we it's it's six of one, half a dozen the other in terms of what I would consider um, accurate information. But it gives us recourse for um, violation of our civil liberties. I mean, I, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not sold on the nationalizing idea because it's like, would you nationalize CNN to make them a more reliable outlet? No, but that's not a platform. Well, CNN yeah, isn't a well, platform. CNN is a publisher. I'm talking about public forums like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and, and th those that are just platforms. And those platforms get to censor because they're private companies and that they don't they're not subjected to our constitutional rights. Mm. And so those things, no, not publishers, not like um, MSNBC or any of those, those can, those are whatever. Um, I'm talking about public forums that um, are, that is where people are being most censored right now. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Twitter, Twitter and Facebook are on a serious, yeah. serious, serious. And YouTube. Time. Mm, YouTube as well. I mean, I uh, I already had a video flagged for talking about something that was in a legitimate. Exactly. It was in an it was in an actual like article. I sent them the article and they just they didn't even like consider the appeal. See, if that were a public <laughs> forum, mm. that would be that would you, you, they couldn't get away with that. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. It gives the control back to us in terms of asserting our civil liberties that right now we don't have. Right now we're just a captive audience to the oligarchs that are answering to the government anyway. Would you be in favor of like the idea of a digital bill of rights to kind of codify some some like rights like 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 the the, the you know the original bill of rights but like online? Absolutely, and I also think that we need to address the issue of our private information. 
and the sharing of our private information. And that's also part of it um, that needs to be addressed. When you were talking about digital rights is our right to protect our private information. Um, this is not something I am an expert on. I don't completely understand the whole thing. So I just defer. But um, Andrew Yang, who is a friend, um, is this is one of his biggest issues about protecting privacy and giving you the benefit to profit from your own information. So in other words, if Google is going to sell your information to whoever to be marketing, da, 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 okay, well, that's fine, but I'm getting a cut. Where's my dividend? That's my information. So it's ownership of your information. I don't completely understand it technologically. You'll have to look into it. But but that is the kind of thing that matters a lot to me as well. Mm. I mean, this is great. This is a great plug again for my book because this is like the opening chapter of my book is, is all about um about how our data is being being hoovered up. And essentially, um, it's not ex- as much like the actual ownership of it. It's like the the copying of what we give them. <laughs> And then the the use and then licensing of that data yeah. as part of their advertising product, um, and as part of, like something I like to remind people as well is if we just like all if, if Facebook did not have our data, it would be worthless essentially. That we we literally are the ones that have, have made it the most valuable company in the history of, of the world, um, I, I think, as far as I'm aware. I'll have to check that. But $800 billion is, is nothing to be to be laughed at. They're, they're no. more powerful than, than most uh, small to medium-sized countries. And they, yeah, essentially, it's the use of our personal data because the more they understand about, how, about uh, both us and how we use their platforms, the more they can uh, use it to A, sell us products, sell us ideas, and um, predict and understand our behavior to keep us theoretically more under control and in the lanes that they believe we should be in and and clamping down on on speech is is a huge part of that because as soon as there's things that you can't say then you know you're censoring yourself a little bit and you're just a little bit scared to say something and it, it doesn't have to be like a big thing like they say you definitely can't say any of these things they just have to like ban one or two people for a couple of small things and then everyone gets worried to talk about it you know? Yeah. I mean, look, there's all different tactics of suppression. Uh, they generally, you know, I am the person that thinks that when it comes to anything, you throw enough shit against the wall, something's going to stick. So I am in favor of many tactics and they are doing the same. So we're seeing it from several different angles. And it could be as simple as um, like on YouTube. I know Jamar Thomas's um, channel got taken down. Graham Elwood's channel got taken down. And maybe what they do is they suspend their their channel for like, you know, a couple of weeks or a month. Well, these are that's their livelihood. These are paid content creators. That's their livelihood that they're messing with. And then they even if they put it back up, are you do, are we considering the loss that they had in that time, not to mention the loss of subscribers from them being absent for however long? So it is very suppressing. It's sort of making people start over from scratch anytime they build up a certain amount of platform. And that's what it's about. It's about knocking your platform out from under you so that you're not capable of speaking truth to power. Uh, and, and look, this has been going on forever. This isn't, this isn't new. It's just that now we have all these different types of, um, platforms that we're, that we have. So we're just seeing it more. Um, but yeah, this is par for the course. I want to say there was like a handful of our, um, progressive shows were taken down and flagged, um, within the past since Biden has taken office. Yeah, Jimmy Dore did a great bit about it and kind of listed through them. Um, I can't remember the exact names of the shows, but I'll link the Jimmy Dore. Yeah, thing. there's there's a few of them. And I know I'd had Jamarl Thomas on my show. He was one of the ones that that got taken down. And this is this has been happening for a long time. Like this isn't new. It's just you're seeing it more uh, condensed, maybe, or more, more at the same time. But people have been fighting these things and blocks and 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 having your stuff flagged and all of this stuff. We've been fighting this forever. I got flagged by face, Facebook for using the word biatch, B-E-Y-O-T-C-H. <laughs> oh, yeah. And and you could have just misspelled beach. I could have. But even yeah. if I said, see, but I again, I'm a pretty First Amendment absolutist. Mm. Um, and I, I really am. I'm a First Amendment absolutist, I, with the exception of uh, screaming fire in a building or, you know, you know, you know, calling for imminent threat and harm to somebody. But uh, for the most part, 
I think we need to let everybody say what they want. And unfortunately, people will get wrong information. That's part of life. The best way to counter it with good information, not taking away the other information. Um, and I also think when we do that, that is part of why we keep repeating the same things historically is because we keep suppressing historically the information that is ugly and that we don't want people to see. And so 20 years from now, 40 years from now, those things won't be there because those had been suppressed. Those videos had been taken down. Those videos were flagged. They'll fall away. And then we sort of whitewash our history. And it just continues over and over again. So, I mean, I mean, suppression of this has been going on since the earliest days of journalism. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.